This episode is titled The Divide, and I begin with a quote from a man known to scholars as Pseudo Dionysus the Areopagite. In a commentary on the names of God, he wrote this The One is a unity which is the unifying source of all unity, and a super essential essence, a mind beyond the reach of mind, and a word beyond utterance, eluding discourse, intuition, name, and every kind of being. It is the universal cause of existence while itself existing not. For it is beyond all being and such that it alone can give a revelation of itself. If that sounds more like something an Eastern guru would come up with, don't worry, you're not wrong. Dionysus isn't called pseudo for nothing. (laughs) We're going to come back to him a bit later. The late 5th and 6th centuries saw important developments in the Eastern church. This is the time of the premier Byzantine emperor Justinian. But two contemporaries of his also made important contributions to the most important institutions of the medieval church in the West. One of them we've already mentioned in brief, Benedict of Nursia. The other is Pope Gregory the Great, who we'll devote an entire episode to soon. By the end of the 6th century, the unique characteristics of the Eastern and Western churches had coalesced in two different traditions. While the West remained loyal to the pattern which was held at Rome, the East emerged in three directions. The major councils held at Ephesus and Chalcedon to decide the issue raised by the debate over the nature of Christ between Cyril of Alexandria and Nestorius of Constantinople produced a three-way split in the Eastern Church. That split continues really to this day and is seen in what's called, number one, the Chalcedonian or Byzantine Orthodox Church, Number two, those called Monophysites, or Oriental Orthodox, which followed the theological line of Cyril, and number three, the Nestorian Church of the East. Now, without going into all the intricate details of the debates, suffice it to say that the Eastern Church wasn't satisfied with the Western-inspired formula describing the nature of Jesus that was adopted at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. In a scenario reminiscent of what had happened all the way back at that first council at Nicaea over a century before, while they concluded the council at Chalcedon with an agreed creed, some bishops later hemmed and hawed over the verbiage. To those eastern bishops beholden to Cyril, Chalcedon sounded too Nestorian for them to swallow. Chalcedon said Jesus was one person in two natures. The balking bishops wanted to alter that to say that he was out of two natures before the incarnation, but after was one nature. Now, for those listening to several of these podcasts in a row, rather than spaced out over several weeks, I know that this is repetitious. In a brief summary, let me recap Cyril's and Nestorius's views. Regarding how to understand who Jesus is, that is, how his identities as both God and man related to each other. Cyril said that he was both God and man, but that the divine was so overwhelmed the human that it became virtually meaningless. And the analogy was that his humanity was like a drop of ink in the ocean of his divinity. Therefore, Mary was the Theotokos, the mother of God. Nestorius balked at that title, saying that Mary was Jesus' human mother, who became the means by which Jesus was human, but that she should not be called the mother of God. Nestorius said that Jesus was both human and divine and emphasized his humanity and the role that it played in the redemption of sinners. Because Nestorius reacted to what he considered the aberrant position of Cyril and because he lacked tact and didn't know when to shut up, his opponents claimed that he taught Jesus wasn't just two natures, but was two persons living in the same body. And for this, he was branded a heretic. But When the Council of Chalcedon finally issued its official stand on what comprised Christian orthodoxy regarding the person and the natures of Christ, Nestorius said that they had only articulated what he had always believed and taught. So, it's little wonder that post-Chalcedon bishops of the Cerulean slant rejected Chalcedon. Their view left the humanity of Christ as an abstract and impersonal dimension of his nature. Because they so emphasized his deity at the cost of his humanity, they were branded as monophysites, meaning of one nature. Now, it's usually pronounced as monophysites. Sadly, just as those who were labeled Nestorian weren't heretical as the name came to mean, the term monophysite is also inaccurate 
because they didn't deny Jesus' humanity. They just said that it had become irrelevant. The Greek prefix mono implies only one nature. So a better descriptor is henophysite. You see, hen is the Greek prefix meaning one, but without the only limiter. But the Eastern pushback on Chalcedon wasn't just theological, it was also nationalistic. The church in Egypt went into revolt after the council because their patriarch, Dioscorus, was deposed. Then, in the 28th canon of the council's creed, Constantinople was elevated as second only to Rome in terms of prestige. So both Alexandria and Antioch, well, they got their togans in a bunch. Those bishops who supported Chalcedon were labeled Melkites, meaning royalists because they supported the imperial church. We've noted that while the Western emperor was out of the picture by this time, so that the Roman pope stood as a kind of lone figure leading the West, the Eastern emperors at Constantinople, well, they still wielded tremendous authority in the church. We might wonder, therefore, why they didn't step in to settle the issue about the nature of Christ. And they wanted to. Several of them would have liked to repudiate Chalcedon, but their hands were tied because there was that one part of the council they wanted to keep, Canon 28, setting up Constantinople as technically Rome's second, but in reality her equal. Now, as I've studied the material that follows the debates between the Hanophysites and the Chalcedonians, I found myself at a loss on how to relate it without well, just boring the bejeebers out of you. I spent quite a bit of time working and editing, then re-editing and deleting and restoring and deleting again before deciding to just say that in the East during the 5th and 6th centuries, just about everyone was caught up in this thing. Emperors, bishops, patriarchs, metropolitans, monks, priests, the common people. There's technical words associated with this huge debate, again, on the natures of Christ. The Encyclion, the Henoticon, the Severin, the Acacian. All these are employed to define the different sides that were taken in the debate and those who tried to forge a compromise between all the positions. And let me tell you, those guys, they failed miserably in working a compromise. They ended up getting hammered by both sides. Regarding the long debate over the natures of Christ in the East, Everett Ferguson says that the irony is that the Chalcedonians, Hanophysites, and the Church of the East were really trying to say the same thing about Jesus. He was somehow at the same time two somethings, but a single individual. Their different starting points gave them different formulations that their opponents couldn't accept for theological reasons and wouldn't for political reasons. Now, switching gears a bit, around 500, one of the most influential thinkers in Greek Orthodox spirituality made his mark. Pseudo Dionysus the Areopagite. His real name is unknown. He claimed to be Dionysus, one of Paul's Athenian converts mentioned in Acts chapter 17. His contemporaries accepted his writings as legitimate, but we know they weren't. Pseudo-Dionysus combined Christianity and Neoplatonism into a kind of mash-up, slapdash theology that appealed to both Chalcedonians and Henophysites. Probably because when you read it, inwardly you said, what? But you had to nod your head saying how amazing it was so you wouldn't appear uneducated. Like when I read or listen to Stephen Hawking waxing eloquent on some tangent of astrophysics, I say, wow, that guy's brilliant. But don't ask me to explain what I just heard. I know there's are English words he's using, but it might as well be ancient Akkadian. Beside being a Neoplatonist, Pseudo-Dionysus was a mystic, someone who claimed to have had an experience of union with God, and not just a, in a deep sense of connection to him, but an actual uniting with the essence of deity. Pseudo-Dionysus became the author of a branch of Christian mysticism that was hugely influential in Eastern Christianity. When his work was translated into Latin in the 9th century, he became influential in the West as well. Pseudo-Dionysus' writings stressed a tendency already found in Greek Christian authors like Origen, Athanasius, and Gregory of Nyssa, who said that the goal of human salvation was a kind of making humans divine. Now, we need to be careful here, because as soon as I say that, all the Western Christians say, wait, what? Back the truck up, Billy Bob. I think we just ran over something. There is in Eastern Orthodoxy a different understanding of salvation from that of Roman Catholicism and ca uh, classic Protestantism. Eastern Orthodoxy understands that the saved are destined to a level of glory 
that is on an order of existence that can only properly be described as divine. Now, humans don't become gods. Eastern Orthodox doesn't say that. Not, not like the one true God of the Bible. But they were created in his image and will be restored to and completed in that image so that they will be as much like God as a created being can be and still not be God. This quasi-deification is attained by purification, illumination, perfection, by which is meant union with God, which became the three stages of enlightenment espoused by classic, uh, classic mysticism. Okay, so hang on with me as we go deep here. Uh, Pseudo Dionysus identified three stages in how someone seeking the fullness of salvation can describe God. First of all, by giving him a name, that's called affirmative theology. Second, by denying that name, that's called negative theology. And then third, reconciling the contradiction by looking beyond language, that's referred to as superlative theology. So the way of negation led to contemplation that marks mystical theology, which was considered a simpler and purer way to understand God. In other words, it's, it's easier to know what God is by concentrating on what he is not. And if that seems backward and nonsensical, well, welcome to the club of those that aren't mystics and just scratch their heads when the mystics start talking. Pseudo Dionysus's arrangement of angels into nine levels became the basis for the medieval doctrine of angels. Reading Pseudo Dionysus can be really frustrating for those who try to parse out his logic and seek to discern his words in some profound truths. While all very spiritual sounding, they're typical of many such mystical tomes. What we find is a cascade of words that defy interpreting. The mind is set in a place of trying to reconcile competing and ultimately contradictory ideas. It's this tension that causes the reader to mentally shut down, and it's in that state of suspended reason that the soul is supposed to be able to connect to God. It's the same effect as repeated mantras and Eastern-style meditation. Still, Pseudo Dionysus was extremely influential in shaping how countless Christians of the 6th through 10th centuries went about seeking to grow in their relationship with God. Today, we dismiss him by calling him Pseudo, fake, fraud, poser Dionysus. <laughs> <laughs> 